Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us this morning, this uh, lovely government shutdown Monday morning. Uh, the shutdown has had a little bit of an impact on our event, for which I'll apologize. Uh, we originally had, as part of our panel discussion, four panelists to talk to you this morning. Uh, uh, it's going to be three, as a matter of fact. So our fourth panelist, uh, Samantha Clark, who we're very uh, thankful that she was willing to join us and was planning to join us and would have joined us, except for the fact that uh, as an essential government employee uh, in Congress, uh, there's other things going on right now that she is going to have to attend to up on the Hill. Uh, so she won't be joining us this morning, I apologize for that. But we have uh, three great uh, other panelists who are going to enlighten us on these critical issues surrounding charting a new course for the industrial base. Uh, and today's event's a little bit of a twofer because we are uh, simultaneously with having this uh, panel discussion going to be uh, presenting to you the findings uh, of a major report that CSIS uh, did last year. Um, and I'm going to get into that. But before I get too farther, too much farther into my remarks, uh, I want to give our standard CSIS security announcement and let you know that uh, this is a safe and secure facility, but if for any reason we were to need to depart, uh, unexpectedly depart, I will be your security officer and I will give you directions about where to go. And it would either be uh, out the back and down the stairs or out the front the way you came in, depending on the source of the problem, uh, if there were one. But we don't anticipate that. Uh, I also want to make sure that I give, uh, uh, express our gratitude to the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, the work that we're presenting this morning was performed uh, under a grant from the Naval Postgraduate School, and we're very grateful to them for their support. Uh, and I also want to recognize uh, the Aerospace Industries Association, because in the process of doing uh, our research, they made available uh, to us the opportunity to come to some of their uh, their gatherings where uh, a number, uh, you know, hundreds of industry partners uh, come, let us give folks a preview of our research, what we were working on, our methodology, and we got uh, very valuable feedback uh, as part of that. Uh, and some of the findings from this report uh, we, we put out jointly in the fall uh, in an executive summary that, they, uh, that we jointly published and it's on their website and on our website. But today we have what, uh, what we referred to in the last six years as the full Frank Kendall version of the report. Uh, that is to say, it is uh, 80 pages of charts and graphs, um, which a select few in the world will read, including Frank. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so he's here, so he can uh, <laughs> give us the full read down because he's probably already been all the way through it. Um, why did we do uh, this study on the industrial base? Um, well, we did it because we got a grant to do it. No, I'm kidding. We did it because uh, it struck us that a lot of the uh, commentary about what happened to the industrial base during the period when sequestration went into effect and during the period of the Budget Control Act uh, was highly anecdotal. Uh, and so there were a lot of predictions made before sequestration was triggered about what impact it would have on the industrial base. Uh, and we had some anecdotes that described that impact. Um, but it wasn't terribly informed, or it wasn't very detailed understanding. Uh, and you also saw folks uh, conveying what I thought was a little bit of a uh, maybe overly minimized picture of the impact because people looked at well, what, was, what were the margins of the big, you know, the big five defense firms? Well, okay, the margins held up. You know, they, the stock prices of these companies did okay. So industry must have been fine. Um, we didn't necessarily know for sure that that was wrong, but it was our sense that that might not be the full story. Uh, and so the, the purpose of this study was to dig much deeper into the data. Uh, we use contract data for this study, as we do for many of our studies, to understand uh, what were the variations within industry by different sectors, uh, by vendor size? There was a lot of concern before sequestration happened that small businesses would be disproportionately harmed. Uh, and then there was, there was a range of other theories out there that we tried to examine. Uh, and then something else that emerged as we went through the study and part through our consultations with, with industry folks was uh, the distinct periods within this time frame because there were so many different things happening all at the same time that affected the industrial base. We were drawing down from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, during much of this period. Uh, there was the uh, sequestration uh, that happened in 2013, which is a one-year shock to the system, but then there was a longer period under the Budget Control Act where, um, where budgets were down, but they weren't necessarily diving in the way that they did in 2013. Uh, and also, another point that is very hard, frankly, to get at with the data is 
the fact that during this entire period we were dealing with shut, government shutdowns, we were dealing with CRs, there was quite a bit of uncertainty uh, in the system. We can't necessarily disaggregate all of those things, but one of the things we did to try to bring some clarity to this was do what we call period analysis. So we had an initial period before the drawdown began, uh, a period when the drawdown started but before sequestration was triggered, uh, and then the period uh, after sequestration was triggered that we call a BCA decline, BCA standing for Budget Control Act. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit, uh, I'm mostly done talking, but a little bit about the, the overall picture, and then I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Reese McCormick, who was the lead author of this study, to give you a few more of the details the, from our study that we wanted to highlight this morning. Uh, and then when uh, Reese is done, I will transition us into uh, the panel discussion. So. Okay, that's the first one. Uh, just a, a brief overview. Uh, I mentioned that we were looking at this period. We start out in 2009. So I mentioned the periods we talked about, 2009, 2010 is pre-drawdown. Uh, that's kind of when the budget was leveling off and flattening out. In 2010, Secretary Gates described uh, it as flat is the new up. Uh, and he uh, directed the department to come up with a plan to live with uh, uh, flat budgets uh, going forward from that 2010 time period. Uh, then in 2011, uh, you see the beginning of the drawdown. The war efforts are starting to wind down, uh, and the BCA is enacted in 2011, although the budget caps uh, are not triggered uh, at, at levels significantly below previous levels until sequestration hits in 2013. And then, as I mentioned, 2013 sequestration does hit, and you have the BCA decline period through 2015. Our charts, we include 2016. That's actually the first year of the recovery. So the, the numbers that I give you in terms of comparison, it's usually up through 2015, as that's the last year of the decline period uh, before things turned around. And over that period, DOD as a total, contract obligations. So this is not budgets per se. This is contract obligations, money coming out to industry, affecting the industrial base. There was about a 27% decline over that period. Now that's a period to period comparison. So that's the average of 2009, 2010 uh, compared to uh, the BCA decline period, 2013 to 2015. And we wanted to look at averages to kind of smooth out, uh, you know, uh, big, big exceptional factors in the data. Uh, for example, you know, with, uh, with some of the sectors, you have these big spikes when com big contracts are awarded or years where there was a tremendous amount of effort in one sector of industry. Uh, and so doing this period analysis tends to smooth out some of those big spikes and big dips. Uh, and we think that's a fair way of assessing the impact. And at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Reese, who's going to walk through some of our more detailed slides. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, my name is Reese McCormick. I'm an associate fellow and I was the lead researcher on this project. So I will take you through some of our key takeaways from the data. So our first takeaway was that all sectors of the defense industrial base saw declines in contract obligations as a result of the defense drawdown and or the Budget Control Act, but the impacts were uneven across different sectors of the industrial base. So to look at the different sectors of the uh, defense industrial base, we categorized uh, contract obligations into 11 different platform portfolio categories. These are a record of all contracts related to that area, um, products, services, R&D generally. Um, so um, these aren't quite based on NAICS codes, they're based on a CSIS methodology that uh, looks at a various, various uh, factors uh, and variables in the data that you can get find in the full report. But basically, we try to divide the defense industrial base and kind of into the major, related to the major platform portfolio categories. And uh, as I'm going through these, if you would like, the full report available on the website contains a much more detailed analysis on, mo on most of these individual platform portfolios. So uh, during the decline, the, uh, all, as mentioned, all, the in, all of these platform portfolios experienced declines of some degree. Uh, the decline ranged anywhere from a 76% overall decline in land vehicles to 8% in aircraft, uh, somewhere in between. So as Andrew mentioned, the, uh, starting with the aircraft industry, uh, sector, uh, at the start of the drawdown, contract obligations actually grew 10%, uh, but then declined by 17% during the budget cap era. 
Uh, so followed that, you had ships and submarines actually experienced a, tw a 28 percent growth during the start of the drawdown, only to then fall 16 uh, percent during the, the BCA decline period. Um, land vehicles saw the greatest decline of all of the platform portfolios, experiencing a 46 percent decline at the start of the drawdown, and then falling an additional 56 percent decline at the, during the BCA decline period. So. Um, and then each of the uh, individual sectors uh, ex experienced declines somewhere between around 15 to 20 percent during both periods. So our second takeaway was that some sectors of the defense industrial base, such as aviation, experienced a whipsaw effect, turning from solid growth to sharp decline in a matter of a um, few months. So what Andrew mentioned at the start, some of the feedback we got when we initially presented our findings was that just beyond the magnitude of the decline in contract obligations, the uh, change in uh, uh, platform portfolio's um, outlook could be just as disruptful. So some sectors went from kind of a manageable decline to a much more steep decline. So for example, our electronics, comms, and sensors, and facilities, and construction platform portfolios saw uh, their rate of decline double during the BCA decline period, while other sectors, such as the three highlighted above, which I'll get into more detail in here in a minute, went from uh, experienced a whipsaw effect going from a path of growth to declines in just a few years. So as previously mentioned, the aircraft um, sector went from a 10% growth to a 17% decline between the two periods. The ships and submarines went from a 28% growth to a 16% decline. And the missile def air and missile defense platform portfolio went from 3% growth during the start of the drawdown during, to the budget, uh, to a 16% decline in the BCA decline period. So. So our third takeaway was that some sectors also saw structural change between the uh, market share of small, medium, and large vendors, but that um, it varied, varied, uh, varied much depending on the individual sectors. So as Andrew mentioned at the start of his presentation, prior to sequestration going into effect, there was this kind of recurring declaration amongst um, members of Congress, various people in industry, um, other analysts that the sequestration would disproportionately target the small contractors. Um, we found that this hypothesis didn't, was not necessarily supported by the top line data, but that the trends did vary significantly depending on uh, the individual platform portfolios. So as a share of overall DOD contract obligations, uh, the, share, the share going to small vendors actually increased from 16% to 18, 18%. So. So this chart shows uh, just four of the different uh, platform portfolios and how the trends in small businesses and uh, market share amongst the different vendors of different size really vary depending on the um, industry you are in. So uh, starting with the aircraft industry, uh, small business really wasn't that affected by sequestration, but that was largely because it makes up a very small part of uh, contract obligations, only about 5%. Instead, what you saw was that the big five uh, increased their share during this period, largely at the expense of small, or sorry, large vendors. So the big five went from 50%, 57% of contract obligations before the drawdown to 60% during the BCA decline period. Uh, large went from 31% to 26%. This was largely due to the growth in uh, contract obligations for big five related to services contracts. Um, in the ships and submarines sector, you do see a lot of volatility, but that is largely due to the uh, HII Northrop Grumman spinoff uh, that occurred in that period. So. Um, you do uh, small business did see a slight decline of about uh, two percent. It went from 13 percent uh, before the drawdown to 11 percent during the BCA decline period. In this, in, um, but that was largely not a result of massive declines in small business contract obligations, but growth in contract obligations for other vendor sizes. Um, small largely held relatively steady as in absolute co uh, contract dollar terms. In land vehicles. Um, it, it, it was a bit of a mixed bag for uh, small vendors here. They did increase their share of market from 7% to 14%. 
However, that was largely because they happened to fall at the slowest rate amongst uh, the vendors of different sizes. Um, they fell 27% of the start drawdown and 34% during the BCA decline period, while the sector experienced uh, significant losses. Uh, finally, um, highlighting the electronics, comms, and sensors market, you saw that the small vendors actually did very well in this market. Uh, they increased their share from 18% during before the drawdown to 24% during the BCA decline period, falling only 4 and 7% um, as in absolute contract dollars, which, given the um, larger declines in other industries, was relatively steady. So. So our fourth takeaway, major takeaway was that over the time frame the study examined, the number of prime vendors doing business with DOD declined by almost 20%. Um, this chart shows the number of prime vendors um, in the, each of the individual platform portfolios. So what, you saw, what we saw was that the single largest decline occurred in the land vehicle sector, which experiences 27% decline in, uh, in prime vendors. Uh, that was followed by uh, declines of between 22% and 20% in the facilities and construction, ordnance and missile, electronic comms and sensors, and the air and missile defense platform portfolios. So in absolute terms, the overall decline was about 17,000 vendors. So that's, um, and then the other sectors saw generally, uh, they kind of held relatively steady, all things considered. So. So, our fifth takeaway was that the land vehicle se sector suffered a serious decline because of sequestration uh, and lost almost a third of its vendors. The sector is the most vulnerable of the major sectors in the industrial base and will remain so until funding for Army modernization recovers. So, in previous CSIS reports, we've, we've talked about how the Army has experienced this triple whammy of declining R&D budgets, uh, declining bu um, modernization budgets, and then it never procured anything. And this is really reflected in the, land the data for the land vehicle sector. So as I've mentioned repeatedly, it experienced a 76% overall decline um, in total contract obligations during the study period. Uh, at breaking that down by product services R&D, the uh, products declined by about 76%, services fell only 53%, but our, our land vehicles R&D fell 93% during the overall decline. And this, this is really reflected in some of the, when you get into the more uh, detailed budget accounts. So the, for, exa for example, in the land vehicle 6-5 account, uh, contract D obligations have been greater than contract obligations for the last five years. Um, our uh, land vehicle 661 is down 71% since 2012, and uh, land vehicles 62 is down 48% uh, uh, two, since 2012. You've seen uh, that in those numbers are generally reflective of the other R&D budget accounts. You do see a sl slight bump in land vehicle 64 in 2016, but we're still, it's not that significant, and so it's a area of concern and we'll be watching this area further. So at this point, I would like to turn back to Andrew to discuss our final two takeaways that leads into our panel discussion on charting a new course for the defense industrial base. Thank you, Reese. So, um, we created a handy chart of our big takeaways to make it easy. Uh, the last two talk about, and there was uh, a couple of things we hoped to get at with a study that we were not able to get at. And so one of our takeaways is there's more work to be done here. Uh, and in particular, I think the work that's going on as part of the administration's industrial base review has an opportunity to be really helpful. Uh, one of the things is we really wanted to get deeper into the supply chain. So you probably noticed as Reese was briefing, he mentioned the phrase prime vendor a number of times. Uh, and that's because the data that, that he was presenting is prime contract data. Uh, our goal at the start of this study was to get into the subcontract data using the, uh, the sub federal subcontract database. Uh, but what we found is that uh, that data is still highly incomplete uh, and it is inconsistent over time. Uh, incomplete is a problem. Inconsistent over time is, is uh, effectively a death knell for doing uh, serious analysis because inconsistent data uh, makes it impossible to do any kind of trend uh, analysis. Uh, if you were to look purely at the data that we looked at in the subcontract database, you draw the conclusion that about 
20 to 25 percent of DOD prime contract dollars are, uh, are then subcontracted to other vendors. Uh, we're highly convinced that that is not true, that the number is in fact quite higher, uh, and so that's the incomplete part. Uh, but we hoped maybe we could dig down into some specific sectors where the data might be better. There are a few where the data is a little bit better, and uh, I'm going to give some kudos to the engine folks. They do a better job probably of recording their subcontracts than anyone. Um, but we weren't really able to do that analysis. So that's an open question. What happened below the level of the prime vendors down the supply chain? Uh, I think it's a reasonable enough guess to believe that if what you saw happening at the prime contract level was happening, uh, it wasn't any better in the subcontract uh, arena would be my guess, but that's mostly an educated guess. Uh, my hope is that the industrial base review will help uh, elucidate some of those uh, issues of what's happening down on the supply chain. Uh, the other thing that we don't know is what happened to those companies, the 17,000 vendors, 20% of the industrial base that stopped doing prime contracts uh, with DUD. And of course, that's an aggregate, right? There's, there's more than 17 that stopped doing business, but there were some new ones that came in. 17,000 is the net change. What happened to those companies that are no longer doing business with DOD? Did they go out of business? Did they decide, hey, we're going to become a commercial company, this uh, defense business is for the birds and we don't want to be part of it anymore? Did they just decide maybe we're better off being in the supply chain and not a prime vendor? We, we just don't know what happened. And so those are some open questions um, that are left at the end of our study that need, uh, need further work. So that is our study. I want to now call forward uh, our three panelists to join me at the table, and we're going to uh, have a discussion about what do we chart a course for the industrial base going forward, uh, given the situation that we're in. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. And uh, again, we, we were going to have Samantha Clark join us as well, but she is uh, unavoidably detained on Capitol Hill getting things straightened out up there. So we, we expect results, Samantha, if you're watching. Uh, to my left is uh, Eric Tuning, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manufacturing and Industrial Based Policy. Uh, and was appointed in that position in October of 2017. It's off to a rip-roaring start. You, you, it's a good thing that there was so little for you to do when you, <laughs> when you came on board. It's just what you want when you take over a job. <laughs> uh, he has uh, uh, 17 years of experience advising decision makers in military industrial markets. Uh, he was a partner with McKinsey & Company. Uh, prior to being with McKinsey, he was a U.S. Army officer, served in Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, and participate in the evacuation of New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. And prior to his in, uh, military service, he was an investment banker at Morgan Stanley, where he focused on uh, corporate finance and global uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, to his left is uh, Frank Kendall. Uh, as many of you know, my old boss at <laughs> DOD. Uh, Frank's a non-resident senior advisor at CSIS and an independent consultant. Uh, he is the former Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Uh, and prior to his time, uh, his most recent time in government, he was Vice President of Engineering uh, at Raytheon. Uh, and, and prior to Raytheon, again, he, had, he was in the government, including as an Army officer for, uh, in his youth. <laughs> and a West Point graduate, as, uh, as has come up more than once uh, when he's been here at CSIS. Uh, to his left is John Luddy, who's Vice President for National Security Policy at the Aerospace Indust Industries Association. And he's responsible for developing AIA's national security agenda and planning and executive advocacy uh, efforts to support it. Uh, prior to being at AIA, uh, John uh, was at Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, as a vice president for government relations. Uh, and prior to that, uh, did some consulting and, and even uh, had some time uh, as a Hill staffer, as I did in my uh, sordid past. Uh, so John, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, I'm going to start and let each panelist just kind of give us some opening thoughts about charting a new course for the industrial base, where we stand, where we need to go. Uh, and Eric, why don't you lead us off? Sure. No, thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you to CSIS as well as AIA for putting this study forward. And it's a pleasure to join Frank and John and you, Andrew, on today's panel. Um, in a similar tone to this report, uh, to fair, paraphrase Secretary Mattis, no enemy in the field has done more to harm our readiness than sequestration. 
And I think more broadly, you know, the challenges the BCA put forward as we think about resourcing the joint force as outlined in the NDS on Friday. All that said, though, I, I am mindful of the fact that if we're going to discuss systematic causes of risk to the defense industrial base holistically, particularly if we want to talk about the sub-tiers, we need to be concerned with more than just sequestration. And I, I'd submit there's at least five challenges that we need to get out on the table to have a holistic dialogue. Uh, the first is one we're here to talk about extensively, which is the cyclical nature of defense spending as well as the impact of BCA. The second are the industrial policies of competitor states. They're actively working to erode the pillars of our national security innovation base. The third is the decline of overall US manufacturing, both capacity and capability. The fourth is the growing human capital gaps in our STEM and trade-related workforce and skills. And the fifth are DOD business practices themselves, which can have unintended consequences that actually exasperate these effects. So I think addressing the challenges and talking about sequestration in the BCA are important, and we should, but we also need to recognize that that's only part of the problem and that we need to address a fuller set of challenges, I think, to take the defense industrial base and the national security innovation base where we need it to be uh, going forward. Thank you, Eric. Frank. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. I basically agree with uh, Eric's list. I want to thank you, Andrew, and CIS and uh, CSIS and AIA for doing the study and keeping this dialogue going. It's really important for the nation. Uh, and I think you always add incremental uh, information that really helps people understand this. The, uh, the, the, the reality is that uh, the Defense Department does not exist for the purpose of taking care of the industrial base. It's the other way around. So what the Department of Defense has to do is ensure that to the extent that it can while it's doing its mission that there is a healthy industrial base to support it. And I will tell you that, frankly, my experience, and I don't think Eric's is going to be any different, the leaders in our system, uh, in the, inside the department, generally speaking, are operational or policy people. Uh, now, right now, you have a lot of people, including the Deputy Secretary, uh, Ellen Lord, in the acquisitions, I guess as of a few days from now, which will be acquisition sustainment. And, and when he's confirmed, I guess, Mike Griffin in research and engineering. I'm not sure who you're going to work for, Eric. Um, uh, all of the above, probably. Uh, but but, but uh, those people are charged, uh, have a great background. They're charged with working, working the industrial base problem and understanding it and keeping it healthy as much as they can, as are their counterparts in the services. But the senior leadership is focused on the mission of the department and actually equipping the force and having the force ready to do the things the department needs to do. So you, it, it was, it's necessary by leaders like Eric and the people that he works with to put on the table uh, industrial-based concerns and get them considered by those senior leaders because they won't do it naturally, with rare exceptions. Uh, we were able to do that pretty well, I thought, in the previous administration. Uh, I see my, my former colleagues in the back of the room who will know what the S2T2 acronym means. Well, I'll, I'll explain <laughs> it to you, Brett, right? Sector-by-sector, uh, tier-by-tier sector, by tier analysis. We, we undertook what was then, I think, a very ambitious uh, effort to try to understand the entire industrial base, all the layers, all the way across the industrial base. Uh, with the evolution of big data capability and things that can be done, I know there are tools in the industry now that understand supply chain extremely well. I think, Eric, we could probably do a much better job than the technology would support at the time that Brett Lambert and I were trying to do it several years ago. So I think our ability to monitor the industrial base, if we take advantage of those things, may improve significantly. And that'll help us identify problems early and then get steps taken. What I did, and I'd recommend this as a best practice, was I would insist each year that the senior decision-making group in the Pentagon for the budget, which is where all this really actually happens, uh, would, would, would have a session on the industrial base. And we would go in, and Brett did some of these with me, and uh, his successors did others where we would go in and spend an entire meeting, essentially, talking about the health of the industrial base and asking for any budget fixes that we needed to address industrial base issues. Most years, we would have a fairly short list of issues where we wanted some money moved into a certain area to help some element of the industrial base. That, that did a couple things. It reminded the senior leadership that the industrial base mattered and that they had to be concerned about it as they made budget decisions. And it gave us the opportunity to fix some problems. Uh, one, to give you, I'm going to give you a little piece of inside baseball here. One of the things that often happened with those meetings is that the four-star people who were normally at the table would be replaced by three-star people. That's not a good indication of what, but people, 
it's a mistake fundamentally to take the industrial base for granted. It is not a given that people will be in the business of supplying things to the Defense Department. So I think that your list is a good list. I think the threat does drive this. Uh, I will pound the table while I have the floor about uh, emerging threats from China in particular, which is challenging us very aggressively for technological superiority. I was very happy to see in the national defense strategy that great power competition was emphasized and that China was emphasized, because it is the thing that has kept me awake for the last decade or so. So we've got a lot of work, I don't, I don't want to go on and take up all the time, but uh, there is a lot that can be done uh, and should be done, and the Justice Department has to pay attention to it, and then at the end of the day, make adjustments in the budget where it's necessary to preserve the industrial base. The, the, my closing comment is about what I think have thought for years and continue to think is the most important thing to address there, and it is research and development. If you looked at those charts that Andrew showed where he talked, for example, about the whipsaw in those sectors, look at the R&D accounts. Pull that chart out and look at the R&D accounts. They're not whipsawing. They're just going down. Look at the R&D account for ground vehicles. It is almost non-existent. The department was very good in the Obama administration at preserving science and technology. That was $10, $11, $12 billion a year. We preserve that every year no matter what. Uh, despite sequestration, budget reductions, and everything else. What tended to go away, because we were trying to preserve force structure and preserve readiness, was involvement in new products, the new product pipeline. That's still a big problem. Now, we got something started, we laid the groundwork uh, for some things through initiatives like the Aerospace Innovation Initiative or some of the work that SCO has done and others to prepare for major programs that, that are needed in the pipeline but we didn't actually fund those programs. So that's, for me, that's the biggest challenge. And in terms of keeping the industrial base healthy, uh, our design teams, our capability to build cutting edge, state of the art, 10 years beyond state of the art programs is, is essential in a great power competition. And it's been allowed to atrophy too much in my mind. Thanks. John. Well, thanks, Andrew. I want to uh, first on behalf of AIA thank uh, CSIS and Andrew in particular and his team for allowing us to work with them on the study of the industrial base uh, uncovered a lot of information that I, that I think we'd all experienced and, and observed and had an anecdotal sense of but this study really brought to light uh, some of the issues there so I, I'm, a, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work with uh, CSIS on that Eric it's nice to see that you are an essential person here on the first, uh, <laughs> the first business day of sequestration or of, uh, of the shutdown, so that, 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 that's a relief. We knew that. And I also want to take the opportunity, sit, sitting next to him, to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your, uh, the example you set in terms of dialogue with industry. It's a critical part of what we do um, uh, as an industry and certainly at AIA trying to convene and, and get the, 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 the smart and active people in our industry together with government leaders. And you really set a great example for that. Uh, Secretary Lord is continuing that, uh, but we, we appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, what the study uncovered, uh, as, as we expected it would, were some very challenging elements of, of the past and to some extent the, the, our current situation. Uh, the, 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 the information is certainly challenging and in some places grim, but I I think it's, a, it's, it's, it, it's also uh, an opportunity now to, to, to look to the future. And I, there, there are really four reasons why I'm optimistic about how some of the things we see in the study may turn out to, or may, may set the stage for some future, some positive things going forward. And I, and, I, and I think there are really four elements. First, there is a clear bipartisan understanding that uh, there, we need to have more resources for national security. Um, you, there, there are arguments about how we get to that. There are arguments about the trade-off between domestic spending and defense spending. That's always going to be the case. But there really aren't people out there credibly arguing that we are still spending too much on defense. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, the second is that uh, I think with this administration, there's, there's been a renewed focus on better business practices. And that is permeating the entire administration. We've certainly seen that kind of language and and focus in the Department of Defense. And I think that's important, you know, as we work in industry to try to meet the needs of our customer, uh, the, the more focus that we can have on, a, on an effective uh, business environment, the better. Third, I would say, and, and, and uh, Frank alluded to it as well, we've got folks in leadership in the department who have come rather directly from industry, the Deputy Secretary, uh, the Undersecretary Lord, and the Service Secretaries who have an understanding of the day-to-day -day challenges in our industry of trying to meet the needs of our customer to de de 
decipher the demand signal to, uh, to have the kind of uh, understanding and relationships and practices that we need. So that's another, another cause for optimism. And then fourth, and the, I think this is really a, a, a tribute to some of the energy that Eric has brought to this executive order effort, we have an opportunity to really focus our minds on the industrial base. The executive order and the assessment will unfold as it unfolds. Uh, there will be a lot of material there. But as it goes forward, and really as, since, it, since it began back in July, it's a great opportunity to, to beat the drum about the importance of the industrial base, the kinds of things that, that my, my predecessors here on the panel mentioned. Uh, it, it, we can't take it for granted. There are challenges, and I think having that out there as a fourth element uh, is a reason for optimism. So uh, Andrew did a great job of, of and Reese did a great job of explaining the survey, the study, and, and the reasons for it. You know, we were, uh, we were not terribly surprised by some of the information. I, I think it is important to, 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 to drumbeat the fact that this was prime contract information, and we know that in, within industry that a lot of the effects of sequestration and the drawdown have been in the, in the subcontracting arena. You know, we, we, we know that our companies track that very closely. It's sometimes difficult to aggregate, either as an association or, even, or for the purposes of the government, because you know, companies are, are justifiably concerned about you know, advertising the weaknesses of their industrial base, of their, of their supply chain. And there's just a lot of data out there that's hard to manage at times. But it is an important area of study, and we do need to do more with it. I think I just finished by, by noting the propitious timing of today's announcement with the release of the, of the uh, National Defense Strategy on Friday, because uh, it really does, in calling for a major, major, uh, co major uh, competitor focus, we're going to need more stuff. Uh, it's simply not the case anymore where we're, we'll be able to uh, uh, e extract from a very large defense structure the pristine key capabilities that we needed, for example, in the war on terror. We're going to need to have a lot more a lot, lot more things in a lot more places and be ready and resilient and able to, to manage the kinds of, of uh, uh, challenges that that means. You know, I, I look at the example of the, the, the ships that we lost this last year in accidents, and I, I think there's more work to do there on what that means and what that says about the industrial base and what that says about our ability to respond in, in a case where we have casualties of, of platforms. That's something to look at. Um, so I'll end there. I do, I, I do think it's, it's, it's a great uh, setup for uh, going forward with the national defense strategy and, and, and really the streamlining and better business practices. We're really desperate for that in industry. We've provided a lot of information and ideas specifically to the department. We have a good dialogue underway, and, and hopefully that will continue. Thank you, John. And um, actually, I think I'm I was trying to keep tally. I think maybe all of you may have referenced the national defense strategy uh, to some extent in your in your comments. So uh, I, I think that's a logical place to start. Personally, I was gratified that the uh, national defense strategy uh, makes extensive mention of the industrial base. Mm. Uh, they usually all include at least a sentence on the industrial base. Uh, some of them may have more than one sentence. This, this discussion, uh, not that it was an extended discussion, but it, it came up multiple times, and uh, it's fairly clear that there was a strong emphasis in the national defense strategy on uh, new cutting edge capabilities and delivery of capabilities uh, in an operationally relevant time frame. Um, and and uh, the phrase that was first used, at least to, to my uh, eyes in the national security strategy and then repeated in the national defense strategy, the national security innovation base, which is not, uh, which is a new formulation yeah. for, for what we're talking about. I'm personally curious about w what's included in it uh, <laughs> uh, because it suggests, the, the focus on innovation suggests it might, might include some companies that would not traditionally have been called to mind when one talks right. about the defense industrial base, uh, but was certainly a focus during the, uh, the last administration uh, through DIUX and other similar efforts. So I would just like to start for the panel uh, with the national defense strategy and what it tells you we need to be doing, thinking about the industrial base that may be uh, either is continuing accelerating things that are already happening or, or starting some new things uh, in terms of the relationship between the department and the industrial base? I'm happy to um, at least take an initial crack at 
the definitional differences between how we're framing the national security innovation base and the defense industrial base. Um, and, and you're right, I think it's the first time this term was used was in the national security strategy. And I think it's an important um, reframing of how we're thinking about the broader ecosystem that we rely on to create the tools for national security, right? So the traditional understanding of the defense industrial base is underneath the broader rubric of the national security innovation base. But the national security innovation base is intentionally defined as more broadly, right? So think of it as the full ecosystem, whether they're the kind of large commercial technology providers, kind of the smaller emerging technology providers, the universities, that broader set of universe that directly or indirectly helps create the tools that rely on for national security. The defense industrial base being a part of that. Uh, it's an important formulation because I think it gets at the heart of Frank something you had said that said, listen, we need to retool our broader defense apparatus for great power competition. And that very much hearkening back to sort of the Paul Kennedy understanding of what that means. How do we at the ground level retool our system, economics on up, for interstate rivalry? And so that requires us to think about where we're going to source technological advantage from areas beyond the traditional formulation. Big picture questions. <laughs> uh, there's some realities that drive this at the end of the day. Uh, one of the main realities is that uh, defense products are unique products. Uh, they're very special in a lot of ways. Uh, the ones that make a difference in terms of our military capability are, are challenging to develop and field and very expensive to develop and field. Uh, they take multiple years to develop, uh, get prototypes built, test, and then get into production. So they're very different in several regards from the products that the commercial world tends to produce. Um, small quantities, very expensive, long lead times, very specialized, very stringent requirements on things like cybersecurity, anti-tamper, reliability, et cetera. Uh, all appropriate, I think, because of the needs of the department. So that's, the companies that do those sorts of products are generally in the category of the big five or six or maybe 10 that are on Andrew's charts. That's not gonna change. Uh, there is no economic incentive for others to suddenly try to become a competitor to those companies in building large-scale defense products. On the other hand, there is some terrific technology out there moving very rapidly in the technology in the commercial world that the department needs to work to get into those products as expeditiously as it can. And we did a number of things in the previous administration to try to help that. Uh, uh, there were a number of things I did under the Better Buying Power rubric in that direction. There was the uh, formation of DIUX out in California and then some other offices that are opening and SCO to try to repurpose and graph some uh, newer technology into some of our existing things. So there were a lot of things that were being done and the institution as a whole was trying to do this as well. DARPA, uh, the service laboratories and others, trying to move technology more quickly into product of the field. Open systems, which has been a, a uh, policy of the department for decades, actually, and open architectures, uh, try to enforce that much more strongly. It's been a policy forever. Uh, <clears throat> and get people to develop products. There's a business interest in the defense primes and not necessarily being all that open. We have to change that equation, and you do that by, by what you demand from them and then how you enforce that. So uh, that reality that I just described kind of drives everything. Then there's a the question of the investments that we make uh, is the next reality and what our priorities turn out to be. There is a need for innovation. Uh, the place that we need innovation the most, though, is not in commercial industry or in defense primes. It's in the operational community. What's happening, and what has been happening for some time, is that the great power adversaries, and Russia and China in particular, even to a lesser extent other countries, have developed what I would call offset strategies to defeat the uh, power projection capability of the United States in particular. Uh, uh, I was uh, in the Pentagon, I was the director of tactical, I was the deputy director of defense research and engineering for tactical warfare programs when the Gulf War occurred. And I, I did, I led the effort after the war to do a lessons learned analysis of the war and publish a report. And there was a lot of discussion after that of something called the revolution of military affairs. I wrote an article on something called the military technological revolution. Uh, the RMA label stuck uh, because there were a lot more people writing about that and had more time to write than I did. <laughs> but but, but the, uh, the point of all this was that we had demonstrated a dramatically improved way to do power projection and conventional warfare. 
Nobody paid more attention to that than the Chinese. And for the last quarter century, they have been investing in things, they've gotten rich, and they've invested in things to defeat our ability to protect power. And they've been doing a very good job at it. I was pounding the table about this for every year that I was in the Pentagon. Uh, so what are we going to do about that? Well, obviously, we'd like to improve our processes. We'd like to get things faster. We'd like to bring in commercial technology. But the innovation that we need isn't in those areas. It's from the operators. People have got to figure out what they're going to do about the threats that they see and whether or not the old ways of doing business, the old operational concepts, are still going to work. I am doubtful that they will. And doing the next generation main battle tank, or doing the improved design of the carrier, or doing the next generation fighter after the F-35 may be exactly the wrong things to do. And we've got to work our way through that. So I think that is the place, frankly, fundamentally, where innovation is needed more than anywhere else. Uh, I think Mike Griffin in his testimony the other day made a comment about operators not being innovators. I don't agree with that. Okay, operators are very good at innovation in the context of the operational concepts that they have. They will take technology and apply it very well to doing the things that they are already doing the way they are doing them. What they are not as good at is abandoning the way they do something in favor of a whole new concept. That's very unsettling, risky, and, and challenging for them to do. But that's what we actually have to do. Once you make those decisions, then you can energize the industrial base to produce the product you decide you need. The problem with the things that we did through, that we're doing through SCO and other places, is that those products are not necessarily being adapted by the people who write requirements and build budgets. And at the end of the day, what we do is defined by those two things, much more than what we do in acquisition. Yeah, maybe just to, I, I think, and I understand completely where you're coming from, Frank. I think there's two ways to think about it, right? There's a bit of a push-pull dynamic. I think there's got to be innovation on the operator side, and then there has to be the confidence that our broader innovation base will provide technological overmatch when those operational requirements are defined, or as our innovators innovate, they understand what the state of the art is that they could be using in a mission sense in a different way. And I think part of what we need to do here is talk about how can we make sure that when we need that technological overmatch from the broader you know, defense industrial base, that it's there for our warfighters as they innovate as they need to. Could I yeah. keep this going? I don't disagree entirely, but I disagree in part because we've tried this. And the results, I think, are fairly predictable. Back in the 90s, we had something called Advanced Concept and Technology Demonstrators. I was in the Pentagon when that program was started. It was started by Larry Lynn, who had been director of DARPA. Uh, and what we did is we put a pot of money aside to fund experimentation. The whole idea was that we would do things that were novel, go out and demonstrate them operationally with prototypes, and then the operators would embrace them, and then the services, essentially, would fund them in their budgets and build them. What happened? We did a lot of successful experiments. We had zero programs come out of them. The reason we, and I'm, I may be exaggerating slightly there, but it's pretty close. And I was passionate about some of those programs. I thought they were really great ideas in terms of operational effectiveness. Uh, some of them, you'll remember, uh, arsenal ship, um, a fiber optic guided missile. Okay, there are a couple that come to mind. Whether those are good ideas or bad ideas, the fact is that doing the experiment was not persuasive enough, no matter how successful the experiment was. And, uh, we're in that mode a little bit now. SCO is doing a number of experiments, which we funded partly out of the third offset strategy work that we did and long-range R&D planning program that we did. Uh, there is no funding to continue those programs. I spoke to a service chief about one of them. Uh, it's a, one we've acknowledged publicly. And I said, okay, after we do this experiment, are you going to put that concept into the Air Force's budget? And the answer was no. That's what we have to overcome. Okay? Well, we have to have, and, and I'm not criticizing anybody, okay? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the, the hard decision is going to be the trade-offs and priorities between more of what we're comfortable with yeah. and something new that we're not comfortable with yet. And, and that's very hard for successful militaries in particular to do. And I think what, and what you'd have to believe is different now than in the use cases before was that we're intentionally devolving power to the services. So presumably... You know, now that they are responsible for that, the, that transition should at least be impacted by the services taking a more active role in acquisition. Okay, the, the power that's being transferred to the services they generally already had uh, in this regard. The services have always owned requirements. I was in the Pentagon in 1986. I worked for the last Undersecretary for Research and Engineering and the first and then the next several Undersecretaries for Acquisition. And one of the things that happened after Goldwater Nichols was that the services with the formation of the JROC staked out the turf of requirements as something they owned, and that's never really fundamentally changed. 
su my successes at getting some innovation into the, into the program were funding prototyping programs uh, in the budget that I raise as budget issues. And I'll give you three, two successful and one unsuccessful. The successful ones were the new uh, jet engine technology for fighters, the ITEP program. Um, uh, uh, it was originally ADVENT, and then it became, I can't remember the acronym, but it's essentially the next generation of uh, prototyping the Air Force is going to lead. The other one was the Aerospace Innovation Initiative, which is the next generation of tactical aircraft after the F-35, which is a prototyping program which is, which is classified. Uh, both of those I was successful. I was unsuccessful at getting uh, a prototyping program in for a combat vehicle for the Army. You saw the R&D curves and the, what's happened to the Army procurement and ground vehicles. The Army fought me tooth and nails on that. They just kept saying they didn't have a requirement and, they didn't have, and that the technology wasn't mature enough to do any new ideas. Um, uh, so it, it, it can be done to a degree from the acquisition community. It requires the strong leadership and backing of the Deputy Secretary and Secretary. You know, people are kind of nostalgic for the Bill Perry era uh, when the Big Five and a number of other modernizations programs were, were, were conceived. Bill Perry funded, when he was Director of Defense Research and Engineering in the 70s, a number of full-scale development programs, programs that were getting ready for production, uh, despite the decline in budgets after the Vietnam War. And he knew it, he did it knowing, I've talked to Bill about this, he did it knowing that the money wasn't in the budget at the size the budget was then, to take those projects on into production and then fill them. But he did them anyway, because he knew that it was important to have that technological advantage ready for the United States. And what happened in the event was the Reagan buildup. And we were able to take all those things into production very quickly, and off we went. Uh, the force we have today came from then, to a large extent. The aircraft, the ground combat vehicles, the helicopters, they came from then. And they've been upgraded many times since, and this is for the most part, there are exceptions. Bill Perry tried to do the same thing in the 90s when he was Secretary of Defense, initially Deputy and then Secretary of Defense, with less success. We kept going some of the R&D programs we had in the, in the uh, Cold War uh, after the Cold War ended. The F-22 was one of them, Sea Wolf Submarine was another, um, and mixed success. We ended up buying F-22s, but in very small numbers. We ended up buying, uh, what, four, I think, Sea Wolves at the end of the day. Uh, you know, we did not have the buildup. What we had instead was 911. And we, we went off to fight insurgencies, essentially, for the next 15 or so years. And that's been the priority department since then. So we have essentially missed an opportunity, a generational opportunity, to do the next round. The F-35 stands out as an exception, and there are a few others, right? So the hard thing to do, the challenge I think this administration faces, is to take some of the foundation that we built with some of these experiments and prototyping that we fund, and fund others. There are a lot of other ideas out there. We had no shortage of ideas of things to do. Uh, the trick is going to be uh, getting the services to embrace those and carry them on. Another example is the unmanned ship that was done, right, as a prototype, right? And the Navy may or may not buy a few of those, but are they ready to really integrate unmanned ships yeah. And for what mission into their, into their force structure? People gotta figure that out. Mm -hmm. I, I think the technology wave that we're in is clear. It's about automation. It's about artificial intelligence. Uh, it may be about a few other things as well, but those were the military side of the house I think are gonna be the drivers. It's about miniaturization of sensors and proliferation of sensors too. Um, how to take those core technologies and embed them into new operational concepts and the equipment that supports those concepts is the challenge right now for the department. Uh, and for the services, and what's been delegated to the services, and Ellen seems to have embraced both the spirit and the letter of the, of the changes that were made on the Hill. I'm sorry Samantha's not here to talk about that. Um, I'd love to talk to her about it. But, but uh, the, the intent there was to foster innovation, I think, uh, and to have accountability more strongly in the services. Uh, we'll see how that all works out. But basically what's been delegated to the services is more authority over the execution of programs and over the major decisions. The thing that was done at the DOD level by, by me and my predecessors was not management of programs. We never did that. What we did was major milestone decisions, which are the points at which at the corporate level we said, okay, we think you've got a program that is postured for success. You have a reasonable schedule, you have enough money, your requirements are executable, you've addressed technological risk intelligently, and off you go. That is the core of milestone B usually is the big decision. And by delegating those to the services, they've opened up the opportunity for the services to, uh, I think, do what they're largely incentivized to do, which is be much more optimistic. And we'll see how this all works out. Uh, but uh, decisions about requirements have always largely laid with the services. Decisions about budgets have always largely laid with the services. And execution of programs has largely always been a service responsibility. That's not fundamentally changed. 
so anyway, to, to, to wrap this up, the, at the end of the day, uh, the innovation we need, and we need it relatively quickly now, we've wasted a lot of time, uh, is about how we're going to equip and operate the force in the future, how we're going to take these technologies that are pretty clear in terms of their trajectory and harness them and employ them in operational concepts. Uh, and we haven't got that figured out. Well, that's a good segue. Uh, I want to give John a chance to talk, and I don't want to rob him of the chance to talk about the national security strategy, but I also drew up this one slide um, because to the point that I think both Eric and Frank discussed, uh, we're, we're looking for new cutting edge capabilities go forward. When you look at the data, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a separation of the vendor size and by area, by which we mean products, R&D, and services. And what's notable to me about this is the decline in R&D revenues going to the big five companies, the, the companies that generally drive the kind of new cutting edge capabilities uh, uh, in terms of delivering them to the field, right? A lot of the technology that makes them go may come from small business and others, but delivering it as a product that's usable comes traditionally from the big five. Uh, and their, uh, their revenues on the R&D side uh, you know, have really collapsed. Uh, and there's no prospect of recovery for that in sight. Even though budgets have turned around, this part of the budget has not turned around, as Frank was kind of getting into. There's some prototyping, but not the system design and development. So, John, just your strategic perspective, and then what do you see from an industry perspective, the kind of incentive that's creative when there's so little revenue coming in for design and development in, in, in that R&D space? So that's a good question, and, and I was struck by something in the, in the dialogue here between Eric and Frank that, you know, from an industry standpoint, the discussion of requirements and how they're developed and who manages the requirements and so forth is, is very important. I would argue that there continues to be room for improvement in the, di in the, the, the presence in the, the, the bringing in of industry to that discussion. One of the things I've been trying to do at AIA is to raise our horizon a little bit and get our companies talking more with senior requirements drivers, the warfighters, the joint staff, the, 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 the combatant command, so that we understand on a five to ten year horizon or even farther, what are the problems that you see out there, what, what are some possible ways to, improve, to solve those problems. There's a lot of great thinking going on in an industry that can, can support that. The more we can do to improve, uh, you know, improve the dialogue and the discussion that we have, the better. Uh, I just would say that, that, that there are two realities that all of this requirement discussion bump into. We're talking about one of them today, and that's the, that's the budget, and that, that is what it is, and, and so forth. The other is the business practices. And the fact of the matter is that we have to take a new look. We have to look harder at how we approach risk in the acquisition process. Because the, the best definition of requirements, the most flexible definition of requirements, the broadest pool from which you have the discussion about requirements will ultimately bump into the management of these programs. And, you know, uh, that is something that we live with every day in, in industry. Um, one of the striking things about the development of, of SCO and DIUX was that it really, in, in many ways, held up the fact that the regular way we do things, with all the brilliant people we have out in the traditional defense industry, is still too slow and not working. It sort of highlighted that. So our position on that was, well, let's not set up two sets of rules. Let's make sure we have consistency across the, across the way we, uh, we, we acquire things. Um, there are lessons to be learned in, uh, from the commercial side. There's lessons, lessons to be learned from the non-defense side. But let's learn those lessons in a way that allows us all to participate and allows us all to be more agile, and again, it all comes down to the idea of risk. We have too many program managers, contracting officers, who, with the best intentions, are looking over their shoulder every day, you know, and 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 that causes them to have to go more slowly than they would otherwise like to. So that's I think is an important piece that we have to keep in mind on a, on a day to day mm -hmm. operational basis uh, in in acquiring things. Yeah, I think that's a good point, John. And I think too the the phenomenon you're seeing here is also an issue with BCA in so much as not even at the top line, but just the inability for the department to send a demand signal to industry or where we would like resources reprioritized. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. part of the, the signaling that's gotten confused now, right? And I think what we'd, you know, in a perfect world, you want to be able to then send the type of demand signal where we can reallocate, let industry know where, where it's worth your time to invest and then essentially, you know, have the flexibility to, to, to send that signal. One of the things that strikes me about 
this chart and roll into it, oh, by the way, uh, CRs, uh, the lack of predictability of the budget, and of course, today of all days, when we're in a government shutdown, uh, they're, they're, you know, we, we have unclear signaling. Yeah. Actually, there's a clear signal that's been sent. <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. not the it's signal not. that the strategy suggests <laughs> we want to send. <laughs> Um, and then we have things like shutdowns, and uh, you know, so it seems to me there are strong disincentives for industry to actually invest in the things that the strategy says that we want. And there's also, it seems to me, uh, and I haven't been in industry, so I'm just going to assert this, a loss of trust that when the department says, okay, we need you to invest in this area, and because it's a priority, that at the end of the day, there's really going to be a return on that investment. So how do we deal with that? You know, I mean, it's, it is what it is, right? We can't change this history, uh, and we can't change the fact that today that we have a government shutdown. But you know, how do we kind of strike a new deal with, gosh, that was, I didn't mean to use that phrase, but um, it just popped out. How do we strike a new uh, bargain with industry that says, you know, if you invest in the capabilities the strategy says are essential, and that you know, Frank has indicated they are essential uh, from his perspective as well, how do we you know, persuade industry that, yeah, it's going to be worth your while to invest in these areas? Yeah. I, I had to take an initial cut at it. I'm sure Frank and John have thoughts as well. I, listen, at, at the end of the day, the most compelling sort of signal is going to be market opportunity and your ability to create market opportunity, you know, both in terms of size as well as sort of the velocity of that. Um, that leads us back to sort of the BCA-related conversation. I think in the absence of that, or as we build to that, and, and John mentioned this earlier, I think it's dialogue, right? And I think it's, it's resetting a conversation. It's being transparent. It's building on common ideas, a common sense of where we need to focus, articulating what the long-term plan is and where, when the money is going to be there, you plan on investing. And then I think also, too, reaching out to industry and, and trying to build relationships where, in the absence of a particular funding profile, what are the things that we can do to drive business reform within the department? As you know, one of Secretary Mattis's three priorities is reforming how DOD does business, right? And I think us fulfilling that and signaling that to industry also helps sort of say in a sign of in seriousness of intent in terms of our ability to sort of do things more effectively, to do things better, and ultimately build a, a stronger relationship with industry. I would offer one just uh, footnote on that. There's, there's cause for optimism in one particular area where DOD and industry have been cooperating very well, and that is in the discussions around our workforce. We share the same demand for the same kinds of people, patriotic people, smart people, innovative people, uh, ambitious people. Uh, there aren't as many of those folks out there as we would probably like to think, and the DOD is sometimes in the defense industrial base is sometimes at a disadvantage in attracting those folks and appealing to those folks. There's been some great work done in the last year or so in terms of a cooperation between the department and industry in getting this message out, you know, working, to, working in, in as young as elementary school level students to, to, to talk about the exciting things that the DOD is working, is working on and that our industry works on. Now it gets tricky when you don't actually get to where you say you're going to get in terms of some nifty programs. So we have to, we have to get that done. But that's an area where there's, there's excellent dialogue, excellent uh, communication between government and industry, and all built around the shared need that we have to get folks into the, into the business. The critical to our industry, uh, beyond everything else, by a wide margin, is return on investment. Uh, Eric spent a lot of time, so he understands this well, and I know John does, no, no, Andrew does. The, the, uh, I, I've sat in a lot of meetings with CEOs, looking at bid, no bid decisions, looking at decisions about you know, how much uh, to invest in something. And it always comes down to a judgment about the return on investment. And you, you look at the competition and your odds of winning, you discount by that. You look at the probability the government will actually do the program, and you discount by that. And the thing that I think will motivate industry more than anything else is acquisition strategies that give industry a clear way to make money and that provide stability. Uh, recent examples, uh, JSTARS recap. What's gonna happen to that? Industry has invested a lot in the JSTARS recap. Yeah. Is there gonna be one or not? We don't really know right now in industry. Um, I, I, and I'm not gonna make a prediction here, we'll wait and see what the budget <laughs> says, and, and, then, and then we'll see what the Congress does after there's a budget. So. 
Uh, th that's one example. Uh, MQ-25. Uh, we argued within the Pentagon when I was there over the requirements for that, that aircraft, that unmanned aircraft vehicle to go on a carrier uh, back and forth. And there were a lot of people who had different ideas about what it should be. At the end of the day, the Deputy Secretary with the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Bob Work and John Richardson, decided on a tanker as the, uh, as the mission for that aircraft, which was a change from previous versions. There have been multiple previous versions, but that had not been one of them. So <clears throat> went off on, 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 on that. Uh, the acquisition strategy that's come out of that is fixed priced, which means it's high risk from a development point of view. When you're doing competition for a fixed price development, you're essentially betting some amount of money uh, on a number of things. Okay? You, you've got to be the low bidder to win. So you've got to be aggressive in your risk in terms of what you're going to put in for cash. Ca when it's a fixed price contract, cost is going to be the major determiner of who wins. Uh, people will all put in a credible design, and then cost will drive the decision. So on a fixed price development, you automatically default to the most risky from a price perspective solution. And, and then that company goes off and you have experiences like Boeing has had on the, on, the, on the tanker, which is a relatively low risk program, the Air Force uh, KC-46, where they've already lost over $2 billion. Now Boeing's got pretty deep pockets, they can afford to lose $2 billion probably, but not everybody's in that position. Uh, so you're asking companies to make a pretty big bet on things like that. And in the case of the MQ-25, some people looked at the, uh, the competition, the fixed price development contract, the likelihood this would ever actually happen, and decided not to bid. And I think for them it was a very reasonable decision. So you've, that, and that was all driven by the government climate. Congress is unfortunately really contributing to the uh, instability right now. I mean, if there were one thing I would ask for from the Congress, from either the industry or the Department of Defense perspective, it's predictable processes that give us budgets somewhere like we ask for on a reasonable timeline and don't yank us around. Uh, uh, we have gotten so used to CRs for the first quarter. I talked to a reporter the other day about this one. I said, look, we've all baked into our plans now that there's going to be a CR for the first three months of the year because there is almost every time. Uh, we have, the industry and government have not baked into their plans that there'll be a CR for six months. Uh, and when we did a CR for six months in the past, when we then implemented sequestration, it was enormously disruptive and enormously costly across the board. Uh, so for Congress to get its act together and have what people call a, a, uh, uh, a normal process, I think, is a, a word of the shoes? A normal order. Uh, would be enormously beneficial to the industry. And it's probably this, the single best thing. The other thing that would be enormously uh, beneficial uh, is to relax some of the constraints on things like new starts under a CR, so we could get on with jobs we decide to do, uh, and to provide more flexibility to the department in terms of uses of funds, so that it could apply funds more, act, more quickly onto threats that emerge, uh, and instead of having to wait for a budget cycle, which can be a year and a half to two years. Uh, those, to me, are the, are the big drivers. We have about 15 minutes left, so I want to open up to audience questions. Uh, that's uh, part of the price you paid for your ticket. Uh, so uh, we have folks with mics who are going to come around. And if you have a question, raise your hand. Let me know. We'll start up here in the front. So wait for the mic. Please uh, introduce yourself and ask a brief question. My name is Dana Baylor from the Elwood Group. We make forgings. Put the big five aside for a second. You've already highlighted. You already know the, the questions. You already know the answers. My own marine background wants for me to take a congressman and grab them by the shoulders and shake till they stop standing. When you look at uh, other than the big five and you make an F-35, without bullets and bombs, it's an air show. So put the big programs aside and you look at small manufacturers that make widgets. There is becoming less and less incentive to even play. So the decision makers, presidents, COOs, watch the news, watch the internet. I've had this conversation in the last 72 hours. Why should we play anymore? How do you, and I'm working with Jerry McGinn on your staff. It's not the DOD, but the deeper you go inside the beltway, the worse it becomes. So how do we get to the congressman and actually wake them up to the results? That they're driving industry away. It's not the DOD. How do we achieve that? What can we do as an industry? I can just, I can just say very quickly, uh, you know, that's uh, half of our members in AIA are small companies. And we've found that one of the most effective tools that we have 
is not necessarily taking the CEOs of our top tier executive committee, but mobilizing those smaller companies to go into the district offices back in, back home uh, to, uh, in, in many respects, the large companies to members of Congress are numbers and, uh, and budget lines to small, to, to, to members of Congress, the small companies are voters. And so, you know, we work very hard to try to get, to mobilize those folks to get that message out. And the more, the more help that we can get in that, the more folks that we can get to do that, is the better. And, and to be fair, I mean, obviously, our, 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 our top tier company CEOs understand that very well and work very hard with that as well to get their, to mobilize their supply chains around these issues. I mean, sooner or later, we've got to reach some kind of critical mass where we don't do this anymore. We find another way to resolve our political issues and not put uh, our economy and, more importantly, our warfighters on the, on the line for it. And just maybe just one point. This is something I know Frank worked in my old predecessor, Brett Lambert, in the back um, when he had the role several years ago. There's a bundle of authorities that my office in particular has to help mitigate shortfalls, whether it's DPA, Title III, or IBAS. And so I think, you know, obviously there's a broader strategic picture that needs to address, but to the extent that there are near-term shortfalls and issues, you know, that's certainly something the department is going to actively try and mitigate and manage on a real-time basis. And we've got, you know, a set of authorities that enable us to do that. Yeah, I think your point about small businesses and, and uh, non-big five companies is right on. The, uh, the, big, the big companies are in a position to bear some of these, you know, w ways of instability, uncertainty, and so on. Uh, and, and they can react and they can absorb those shocks much better than small businesses can, who don't have the same access to capital, uh, don't have the same business base to spread things across and so on. So it's a very definite. It's the reason we, we tried so hard to get down through the supply chain. Now, one person who may in the department, I think a lot of people understand that, but one in particular is Pat Shanahan, who was the supply chain manager for Boeing, basically. Um, so I think there's an appreciation of that. Then the question then becomes, what can you actually do about it? Uh, I think part of that has to be, uh, given the nature of the problem, driven by people coming forward and saying, I've got a real problem here. In many cases, the primes will work with small businesses to try to carry them over because they know they're dependent upon them. So you get that, too. Uh, it's got to be a total community effort to, to address the problem and identify the most difficult issues that where real help is needed and then put resources on them to, to carry people over. I worry as much as anything about smaller businesses who, for whom the defense part of their market is not the dominant part of their market because the argument that the presidents and CEOs have of those companies is, you know, does it make it sense for me to even stay in this market if I've got an alternative? Mm -hmm. I mean, the big primes have no choice. I, I was in the 90s. I was at... Uh, Raytheon was mentioned. We were trying to do commercial things. We were not a commercial company. We did not know culturally how to do commercial things. We might have had the technology, but to take the kind of risks that commercial firms take routinely, uh, it was not in our genes. And it's not in the genes of those big defense companies either uh, today. They're not prepared to go out and do something else. They're going to be there for the Department of Defense. But the small businesses, you can't say the same. And that's a real concern. Yeah, well, just maybe add that I did spend a lot of time on the Hill myself, as I mentioned. Uh, I was struck at the start of last year with the new administration coming in that uh, the first budget resolution that was released, which, and not to get too technical, but which was an FY17 budget resolution, so it was really the previous year's budget resolution they were exploiting, uh, it didn't change the defense budget numbers, right? It kept, uh, and I, you know, kind of highlighted that point on Twitter and someone on the Hill wrote back and said, oh, well, you know, don't worry. There's going to be another budget resolution, and we're going to do two reconciliation packages, and then we're going to raise defense spending. Now, in my 17 years on the Hill, there had never, you know, you were lucky if every five years or so you'd get one successful reconciliation bill done. To do two in a single year struck me as optimistic. Well, it turned out it was pretty optimistic. And so the fact that defense was at least third and perhaps farther down the list of priorities was a concern, and I think is now that's realized risk, to put it in defense terminology. Uh, but having said that, now I do want to say Speaker Ryan was here uh, at the tail end of last week and really foot stomped defense and said this is now my top priority. So uh, I'm hopeful that this year's budget resolution and budget game will, will go in a different direction. Uh, other questions? Tony in the back, and then we'll, we'll work forward in the middle. Hi, for Mr. Chewing, uh, Tony Capacity with Bloomberg News. Uh, two quick questions. What are the immediate and then longer term impacts of the shutdown in the industrial base if it goes two weeks or more and two at 
what point will we learn the, your, the new administration's views on mergers and acquisitions? In particular, whether you'll be abandoning the prior administration's opposition to merger activity among the top five. Thanks. I, you know, I'll tell you that I was Secretary Mattis over the weekend made the point that said, listen, the Department of Defense's main mission, right, is to continue to protect the American people through the shutdown. So I'm not going to speculate about what the broader implications are beyond that. You know, the, the DOD is going to stand on the wall and hold the line. Um, in terms of mergers and acquisitions related, I think Ms. Lord's already commented on this. Um, so I'm just going to reiterate what she had said before. We're going to continue to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. No. The, the, correct. the current plan is to continue to view things on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, let me make a comment on the impact of shutdown. Uh, I lived this in 2013. Uh, we had about two weeks, and uh, we had done quite a bit to prepare. We'd had a couple of false starts. We had done quite a bit to prepare. We had a couple of false starts, so that had allowed us to mature our planning process. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and and these things always go to the last minute, right? They always don't, yeah. you don't get a solution until the last second politically. So to some degree we were prepared, but there were still a lot of unforeseen things that happened. Uh, little things, some of them have been in the news already, like sports teams being trapped somewhere and not having money to, TDY money to bring them home and stuff uh, from the academies. Uh, we had issues like uh, support to movement of, uh, there were a lot more casualties happening then and moving families to Dover to be there for when their loved ones' bought, remains were brought back, things like that. Um, we took the law seriously in terms of what's essential and what isn't. It's a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act to spend money that hasn't been appropriated. That's a pretty serious thing, and it's drilled into every government employee who manages money for the government uh, that you can essentially go to jail for violating that. So you gotta be very careful about that. Um, we did do everything we could to mitigate the damage. There's been some talk in the press about how we weaponized. That's nonsense, okay? We, 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 we did everything we could to minimize the damage. There was plenty of damage without any help. Same is true when sequestration was implemented. Um, the place where it gets worse over time, and the reason it gets worse over time is that industry has to take people that are on service contracts, for example, who are supervised by the government, and they don't get the work anymore. But the, the industry, do you, do you not pay those people? You know, I'm involved with one of those companies right now, and they've decided they're going to carry people for some unknown period of time, a couple of days maybe, but they can't do it for very long. It's, it's too much of an impact to the bottom line. So eventually you have to furlough people that aren't going to get paid for that period of time. So that's, and those people are going to continue to work for you after that? It's a good question. Uh, the, another major impact is in the factories. Uh, completed work, you basically can park in the lot until somebody can come inspect it. So that's not really the problem. The problem is work in progress. And the government inspectors for that work in progress, mostly from DCMA, being pulled off the line. So then you get to a point where you need an inspection on whatever your assembly, assembly you're doing before you do final assembly. And without that inspection, you can't do the next step of manufacturing. Factories stop. Okay, that's a big deal. Uh, and it has a big impact for a lot of blue collar workers, a big deal for a big impact for the, the companies themselves. Those costs, to the extent that the industry can, will be passed on to the government and claims that come about afterwards, to the extent that their contracts allow them to do that. But it's a cumulative damage thing, and it gets much, much worse as time goes on. Early stages, you can kind of figure out ways to park things for a little while and do workarounds and so on. But pretty quickly, you get into trouble uh, that's much more significant. And so hopefully this thing won't last very long. Um, let's come back here with uh, Marjorie. Thank you. Marjorie Sensor with Inside Defense. Um, Mr. Tuning, could you give us an update on the, uh, the defense industrial base review now underway following the executive order? What's the role of industry going to be and what do you kind of hope is the outcome if you're looking a year or two years down the road after this is complete? Sure. Um, so things are uh, progressing as we'd expect. Um, we're on target for the April delivery to the president. Uh, the role of industry, we're working with AIA, NDIA, and PSC on a set of industry outreach. Uh, we've already gotten input from them. They've been terrific partners, and I thank John and his industry association colleagues for their leadership and support um, across the board on that. And I think, you know, looking more broadly, I, I expect this won't just be a one-time exercise. I think to do it right, you know, you've got to initially start the dialogue and the frame around what we need to do the industrial base. There'll be a set of recommendations that come out of this, and then we have to see those recommendations through. 
I would just add to that, if I can, uh, echo uh, Eric's comments about the, the good work we've done so far together, I think, and, and very, very clearly have an have, uh, uh, open mind and a good audience in the department for talking about what, what concerns us. There will be a point, I'm sure, where we get uh, the assessment and the, and the recommendations, and there'll be a point within that where we depart ways in, in some sense in terms of maybe it doesn't go far enough here, maybe it's not, not touching on the right issues here, and then we'll continue to engage in dialogue. But I think it's all in, a, in the spirit of understanding both from the, 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 the customer standpoint and from the provider standpoint in industry about a lot of the same issues. So it's been a great process so far. I think the most important thing about this executive order is frankly not the substance of the assessment, which is gonna be important. I think it's the fact that as I said early on, it hangs an issue out here for all of us to continue to focus on and, and to talk about that will, will go well past April. I'm gonna come over here and then I'll work back over. Hi, Frank Finelli from Carlisle. I'd like to just follow up on the comments, Andrew, on the decline in research and development. And a lot of the research and development increasingly appears to be directed to the RDEX and the university, so there's not as much competitive opportunity for it. And a lot of the IRAD is not reimbursed, particularly on anyone that's not a prime contractor. Is there anything that's being done to look more fully into this kind of crowding out in R&D or the lack of reimbursement? I think I, just to answer your, your question broadly, Frank, I think we're looking at ways in which we can get the biggest bang for our buck from an R&D perspective. And I think the, the comment earlier around the national security innovation base, the broader ecosystem of folks that are supporting it, there's a bunch of issues in there. I think the one you, were, you, you, you mentioned is one of them. Um, and we're looking at, at R&D as an underline to what we're doing for the EO. So it's something we're looking at. We'll see as that process involves what, what comes out specifically. I appreciate the concern. Yeah, Frank raised a good point. You have to distinguish the science and technology accounts and what happens there. And then what happens kind of just to, on the gray area between that and a real program where you do prototyping, which may be done at a research and development center. And then actual programs, which are generally done with industry, and then the money becomes big at that time when you start to do either to some degree risk reduction, but really full-scale development or engineering and manufacturing development. I used to have, and I pointed these out to Ellen uh, Lord the other day, I uh, asked her to, if she'd seen them at the time, a few months ago she had not, and Eric, you ought to take a look at them as well. I had posters made of, uh, originally I did the Chinese development programs. I said, okay, here's the new product pipeline for China. Here's what it looks like. I had a big classified poster, Andrew will remember these, uh, that laid out in each war fighting area all the new development programs. It was a full-size poster with small print and very dense with programs. It's classified. There's no public version of this that I know of. Uh, a couple of years after I did that, I said, it'd be interesting to do the same poster for the United States. And I knew what it was going to look like already. Uh, but I wanted to have the, that graphic. So I asked people to do a poster for the United States that showed exactly the same thing. Our new product pipeline, all the weapon systems we have in development. And the first one that was produced for me had much larger font size than the Chinese one. And I said, no, 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 no. I want the same font size. And because I want people to see that white space. And that's what it was. It was all white space. And where the R&D money needs to be applied and where we need to make some decisions is to the new product pipeline, the things we're actually going to put in the hands of warfighters. Not that we're going to play with and do experiments with, but that we're actually going to field. And, and that's, that kind of work is what's going to uh, fuel the industrial base, frankly, and give people something to, to invest in. You know, asking people to invest in prototypes when there's no follow-on program, even in the budget, is asking a lot. Industry will do a little bit of that, but pretty soon they figure out that that is a, an investment without any return at all. Uh, so that, that's where the shortfall is to me, and that's what has to be addressed. And, and there's this tension in the process between bang for the buck and uh, getting things faster. And that's part of, there's a lot of that in, laced into the defense, national defense strategy to, uh, presentation that we, we, it's not just about efficiency and saving money and seeing payoff down the line, but we've got to get things going faster. And that, I think, kind of goes back to my, my, my observation about risk on the front end. Uh, yes, we need to make money at it eventually, but we also need to probably try, try things more, fill things more to stay ahead of our, our, the, the, the threats that are out there. We have time for one more. We'll come right here. Jeff Bielos. I'm a private practice, sat in Eric's chair a while back. A um, couple of quick points. First, 
Um, you mentioned, I agree with your general uh, priorities you laid out, and that's great. But on globalization, you really only mentioned the downside risk of foreign countries that are, you know, uh, competing with us. And I think there's an upside to globalization. Just to comment, one, this administration is going to have to muddle through and figure out, well, we have muddled through on globalization, I think. This administration is going to really have to sort through its priorities there, because on the one hand, uh, we have America first and buy America. On the other hand, the question is, how do we collaborate with, uh, you know, foreign friends and allies in that context within that constraint. Second, um, I think when I look at your charts, Andrew, I would quibble because the time series only starts in 2009, and there are a couple of contextual realities here. One is I remember being in the department at the end of 2000 when everybody cheered when Bill Lynn walked out the $300 billion, $300 billion budget in 2000. Um, I think if you looked at in the back years, you'd see the highest defense budget, the history of defense budgets in the 06, 07, 08 period. So when I look at this today, I say, you know, if you look at the range of budgetary outcomes, is this really that bad for an industry where the top companies are doing great and are highly valued? Uh, and really, shouldn't we be living within our means a little more here? I mean, because if you look at the numbers, we're in rarefied air of where these budgets are overall. And finally, for Eric, Ellen Lord also said in testimony that she didn't foresee a situation where five companies, the top primes, would be, would, would be able to merge with, with each other. Is that uh, the policy today? Yes, yeah, so let me, I guess, go back to your first comment, Jeff, and I know we talked about it a bit this last week as well. I, I wouldn't imply that there's a downside to globalization, right? I think we're very actively now working through the INTIB, which is designed to help drive closer defense industrial base integration with our key allies, you know, the UK, Australia, and Canada. So uh, that certainly is part of the equation, particularly since one of the Secretary's primary priorities is strengthening our alliances and building new partnerships. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't interpret our concerns around long-term strategic competition to be us turning our back on our friends. It's quite the opposite, really. Um, in terms of the m and I mean, I think I've said this before, we're, you know, the, the, we're going to look at each individual case on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, I mean, the only thing I would say, uh, your point is absolutely right and fair, well taken. 2009 was a peak in defense spending. Uh, that's one reason why we wanted to dig deeper. So when you look at the sectors, some of them are doing okay, and in fact, uh, you know, I get maybe shot for saying this, but one of the takeaways that we didn't emphasize is, you know, the shipbuilding sector did reasonably well. They, they came out okay. And when you look at where they've been historically, they're doing better now than they were in the late uh, 1990s when we were doing four ships a year. So that's true. Some of them aren't doing as well, right? Even at a period where you have historically high defense spending, we are spending literally uh, nothing. Uh, in fact, negative amounts if you conclude de-obligations. Right? We are actually de-obligating faster than we're obligating for development of new ground systems. Uh, so the ground vehicle sector is doing terrible, uh, even on a uh, you know, adjusted basis. Now, they were coming off at a, a tremendous high uh, in 2008, 2009. But to my mind, that just makes it worse. Right? You come off the highest high you've ever had to the lowest low you've ever had. That's hard. So just in terms of impact. Um, Thank you very much for uh, coming to our event. We've come to the end of the 90 minutes. Thank you for giving us that much time. And I do want to let you know that the, uh, this is the full glossy uh, report. It is on our website. There is a limited number of hard copies that very special people can get. You may be one of those people. See me. Uh, and uh, uh, again, thank you very much for coming. And please join me in thanking our panelists.